Welcome to And That's the Game Podcast. Presented by Pro Batter Sports. And That's the Game is hosted by Wayne Mazzoni. Today's special episode, Wayne Mazzoni's insights on college recruiting. Hello and welcome to this episode of And That's the Game podcast presented by Pro Batter Sports. Those of you that follow this podcast know that there's always a guest. On this episode, there will not be, it'll just be me. I'm going to try to keep this episode to about a half an hour where I'm going to give a quick overview to a topic that is near and dear to me, which is the recruiting process. So I get more questions from parents and athletes and coaches about the recruiting process than really anything else. Um, so to kind of give a good overview of, to bring you up to speed on what the current recruiting process is about. I thought I'd do a solo episode. For those of you that are listening, not watching, I would encourage you to find this on YouTube where you can watch the video because there will be a PowerPoint that I'm gonna start shortly. Uh, It's not absolutely crucial that you can't follow the information. It just might be better if you're able to watch and see what's on the screen. So without further ado, let's get uh, started on this uh, presentation on the recruiting process. Um, one final thing to say before I do start it is for those that are interested in a full entire overview of about an hour and a half speech, um, I have a full recorded seminar that I've done in person on my YouTube channel, which is Coach Mez. So um, this, I think, could actually be better because this is Um, the most essential part of things instead of watching an hour and a half, which most people don't want to dedicate an hour and a half to watch a full episode. I think here in this half an hour, you'll get the same information. But if you did want more, that's a place that you could go. So without further ado, here's the 10 steps that you will as the player or the parent go through to navigate this recruiting process. So the first step is to know what you're up against know what you're up against. And what does that mean? That means that this recruiting process is incredibly, incredibly competitive. Just because you or your son kind of likes baseball and has played since age five and is on a travel team does not mean that you automatically will get a opportunity to play at any level of college. So if you could see on the screen, these are the last numbers. And I'm obviously just talking about baseball today. Um, This is a survey done by the NCAA, a study, which shows that there's about 482,000 high school baseball players, but there's only 36,000 NCAA Division I, II, and III players. Now, yes, there are some NAIA schools and junior colleges and community colleges, but most kids, when they think about recruiting, they're looking to go to NCAA Division I, II, or III. Well, you can see on the screen, 7.5% go on to play at any, any level of college. 2.2% 2.2% make it to Division One, 2.3% make it to Division Two, 2.9% make it to Division Three, and that again means this is really competitive. So some further things to think about: when kids do commit, when they're lucky enough to commit, every kid in the modern world goes to Instagram and they make a post that says, "I'd like to thank my coaches and family. I've just committed to Villanova University." Right? Well, what you are not seeing is the other thousand kids every time there's a post that should post or want to post but wouldn't, I'm overwhelmed with recruiting. I'm not getting any attention. I don't think I'm gonna be able to play in college. This is really frustrating. It's stressful, it's confusing. So you only see these great results on a post. You don't see the frustration that goes behind it. So for every Instagram post you see, there's about another thousand that would be like that if they were to post that. Secondly, if your mind is mindset is D1 or bust, you're very likely to bust. What do I mean? Well, I only want to play at Clemson. I only want to play at Duke. I only want to play at Penn State. That's a great goal to have to play Division One, but your goal should be, I want to play at a school that is a good fit for me academically, athletically, socially. Yes, you'd love it to be Division One, but if it's not, and you could still play at a Division Two or Three school, and that's your mindset, then this process is very likely to work out for you. Um, One thing didn't show up here, 
which I'm, I'm not sure why it didn't, but I want to make sure that I, I point it out. Along with that 7.5%, that play in college, the best way to think about this is it's actually half of that as a position player and half as a pitcher. So, for example, if I'll just stick with Villanova, a Villanova is going to bring in 12 kids per recruiting class. It's typically going to be six pitchers, probably four righties and two lefties. And they're going to bring in six position players, a catcher, two infielders, two outfielders, a utility player, and then possibly a two-way player. And most schools kind of just continuously recruit a similar recruiting class. Um, so they're not only one year looking for middle infielders or one year just looking for catchers. They're pretty much recruiting the same recruiting class. But the reason I bring that up is many people say to me, well, you know, I'd love my son to play at University of Maryland. You know, don't you think he could get an opportunity at University of Maryland? Well, maybe. But there's hundreds of thousands of kids that want to play at University of Maryland, but they only bring in 12 players, six position players, six pitchers. So this first, you know, step is not to scare you off, but it's to be a little realistic of what you are facing when you say your goal or your child's goal is to be a college baseball player. Okay, number two, that is a key step in this process. Obviously, academics have to be a huge part of this. And while not every baseball player has to be locked in onto academics and have to have a perfect GPA and make the honor roll and take all AP classes, the reality is the better your grades are, the more options you have when it comes to getting recruited. And in, in addition to the more money that you'll actually save based on your financial aid package. But the reason I bring this up is the worst place to be as a recruit or the parent of a recruit, and this happened to me many times in my coaching career at five different colleges over 30 year span, you'd find a player that you love and that you want to recruit and they like your school. And then you get the transcript and you send it into admissions and admission says you cannot get this person in. It's a very frustrating place for the player and for the coach. And the better the grades are, the more options you will have to get yourself recruited. Um, number two, coaches do not want to recruit academic headaches. If you're going to bring in one catcher in the class of 2025, and you're going to look through 75 catchers to sh shrink the list down and get it down small to maybe four or five you're really considering, if somebody is an academic headache and you're worried about if they're going to succeed in college and they don't really pay attention in class and you get a bad report from a teacher or a guidance counselor, the coach will just move on to another player that's equally as good on the field and that's less of a worry off the field. Um, I said this before, the better your grades, the more academic money you can have. Colleges are extremely expensive and some might say overpriced. And if based on your grades, you can get 15 or 20 or $25,000 in free money, not loans, but free money from that university, it could go a tremendously long way. And we're not even talking about scholarships, which we'll get to. Um, and then of course, <clears throat> just like anyone who volunteers, who is in the choir, who um, runs their own business, you can use baseball to help you get into a school that you otherwise not may not have been able to get into. Why? Because you're more than just a transcript. You are somebody that's going to contribute to the university, to the baseball program. So sometimes people look and say, well, I don't know if I can get into this school and I'm not even going to try because I'm below their admission standards. Well, you know what? If the coach is really interested, the coach may have that ability to get you in because of your baseball skill. So there's no hard and fast rules, but that could be a goal of this process is to use baseball to get you into a college that you otherwise would not have been able to. Um, if your grades are not where you want them at the moment, number one, get an academic structure of some sort. Everybody watching this, the kids probably know how to strength train. They know how to eat. They know how to practice their skill work. Well, you know what? Your academics require the same structure and plan. So even if that's setting up an area at the house with no distractions and writing down when assignments are due and always making sure that you shower before school and sit up front when you're given the opportunity, that can help you up your grades. And the reality is if your grades improve over time while you're in college and they trend up, that goes a long way to admissions places, you know, admissions officers at schools 
letting you in, as opposed to trending down, which becomes an issue. All right. Number three thing that is a big factor. You need to get yourself or your kids on campus as much as possible. Soon, <clears throat> excuse me, soon you will run out of time to be able to do this because of other commitments and travel ball, et cetera. And I'm not talking about doing open houses. I am not talking about meeting with coaches. I'm talking about any time that, let's say I'm in the Connecticut area. So let's say I was advising somebody that was going this weekend. Well, they wouldn't because they're in baseball season. But let's say it's after the high school season, they're going to go visit a relative up in Massachusetts for the weekend. Well, I would say to them, you know what? On the way up, why don't you drive and look around four or five campuses? Could take you... 20 minutes at each school. Sometimes you could just park and look around or drive around campus or park and walk around for five, 10 minutes. And then on the way home, visit four or five schools and start to see, do you, what kind of environment do you like? Do you like a bigger school, spread out school, bigger enrollment, smaller enrollment? Do you like being in the city or the suburbs? When many kids are trying to start the recruiting process and they're trying to figure out what schools are right for them, but they've never been on campuses and have no idea what they like or don't like, it's extremely difficult to manage this recruiting process. So even if somebody was able to say, and this could take them six months to figure out, well, I want to be three or four hours from home in that you know range, no further than three or four hours. I'm looking for a school with five to 10,000 students. I'm thinking about being an engineering major. I'd like to be near a city, but not in a city. And I have a 3.5 GPA with a 1300 math and verbal. Well, now just knowing a few things about yourself and what you like, your list of schools can start to shrink down considerably. And the reality is unless you're one of the best players in your state, if you don't understand how to handle the recruiting process, you will get overlooked in this process. It can be too difficult. There's too many kids, too many teams, too few coaches recruiting, it's an overwhelming thing. Trust me, from a guy who recruited his whole life, it's overwhelming to track all the kids. But when a kid does his research and shows that he likes your school and your program and does some of the things I'll talk about later in this presentation, it makes it much, much easier. Okay, the fourth step is you have to get some assessment of your talent level. It's not just what your parents think because, yeah, you're pretty good on your high school team or, you know, parents are the worst judges of athletic talent because we love our kids, number one. And number two, they're not comparing you, the child, against the best players in the country. They're saying, oh, you're a pretty good player on your team in New Hampshire or Massachusetts or upstate New York. Well, I don't know that you could be if you're the best player on your high school team in upstate New York. You could be a first round draft pick. You could be Vanderbilt good. You could also be not good enough to play at any division three school anywhere in the country because the reality is the talent that you're facing is not very good. So baseball is very difficult to make an assessment of your talent level. And if you do say, hey, I'm a division one player, but you're really not, you will spend a year's worth of time and money trying to get schools interested in you, which will never be. So the sooner you can narrow down what your ideal or likely talent level is, the better. And here's some five quick things to help you do that. Number one, ask your coaches, your high school coach, your travel coach, if you take lessons. That person probably has coached many kids that are playing in college and has an idea of where your sk skill set fits in to that next level. Number two, any friends that you have that are currently playing in college that maybe in the last year or two, you played with at your high school or your travel team. So if they're now playing in a division two II or three or whatever, division one school, hey, if I was on that team, would I fit? Could I make that team? Would I play right away? Would I not play? Getting feedback from those friends would be really, really valuable. The third thing you can do is go to certain camps and events and showcases where you actually get graded out by college coaches. Typical camps, you go, you play, you don't get any feedback. But there are camps which are set up for the purposes of evaluation where you can actually get a grade. So you do a camp for three days and a college coach who's working that camp 
will give you a report at the end of camp saying, I project he was a Division three player. You need to run a little better, be a little stronger. And if that's the case, maybe you could play at a Division two level. But here's where I see you right now. Fourth option is someone like me. I coached college baseball 30 years. Now I have my own business helping high school baseball players get recruited for college. The biggest first step is, hey, what level is right for you? So I evaluate kids and give them straight up honest feedback. And sometimes I do that for kids in eighth and ninth grade. While I don't think anyone should be worrying about recruiting in eighth or ninth grade, would you rather find out you don't throw a good enough change up in ninth grade? Or would you rather find that out in junior year when it may be too late to make the adjustment to change? So I feel like getting an honest assessment of your talent level earlier is better because it gives you more time to get faster, stronger, better, et cetera. Last thing on this particular topic is watch colleges practice or play in person when you can. Now, for those of you watching this, maybe you're in a different part of the country where you don't have that division one, two, and three teams right in your area. But if you do, watching these colleges with your own eyes is a huge wake up call. Yes, you can watch a little bit on TV, but for the most part, it's division one schools on TV. And we all know baseball looks a lot easier on TV as opposed to when you're actually performing it. And the reason I say to do this is sometimes kids will go watch a division one team and where they previously thought, well, I'm not a division one player. I, I could never play at that level. They'll actually go watch the game in person and say, wow, I actually think I could get to that level if I do X, Y, and Z. And then conversely, I've had many kids who go watch a Division three game where they thought that was like 13th grade, just barely beyond high school level of baseball. And they realize how massive of a jump it is in skill, pitching velocity, size, talent, speed, all of that. So I would encourage you, if you have that opportunity, to go see that next level that you're ultimately trying to get to with your own eyes. All right, and then ultimately what you're trying to do, and again, this is a quick presentation. This could take you a month to do even the things that I've said so far. But you have to start with some initial list of schools that fit what you want out of college, meaning big school, small school, location, setting, all that, and major, et cetera, if you know it. Your academics, your profile. So if you have a 4.1 GPA in all AP classes, and an almost perfect SAT score. There's going to be some Ivies and Duke and Stanford, et cetera, or NESCAC schools. If you have a 2-2 GPA and didn't even take the boards, there's a great set of schools for you. It's just going to be different. So you're trying to use your personal likes, your grades, and then your baseball talent level to come up with a list of schools. I highly advise that you put it on a spreadsheet, organized, structured, whether you want to use a Google Sheet or Excel, the list of the schools, the conference, other information, academic piece, the website, the coach's name, um, and or maybe even rank them. Here's my top group, my dream list of seven. Here's my middle list, list of seven. Here's my bottom list of seven. You'd, you'd be happy with any of those, but you're organizing it. I just said that, rank the top, middle, and bottom, um, and update the list as it changes. All of a sudden, you get feedback from a school that says they're not interested, cross it off the list. Maybe you hear about a school that wasn't on the list previously, and then you decide to add it. But here's a kind of an example, again, for those of you watching um, live, here's a particular kid that I had uh, worked with that actually wound up committing to Dickinson. And here's just a little bit of the spreadsheet where we had the list of the schools and his interest level in that school and the update of where he was in dealing with the coach. And then me as the advisor, did I reach out to the school yet? And what the feedback was that I got from that coach on that player. And this spreadsheet is a work in progress, uh, always changes daily, weekly to update what that kid's doing for development and the recruiting process, you know, very specifically. Um, so hopefully you've gotten some information so far. We're going to take a short break right now and we'll be back with our podcast after these messages. Introducing ProMatter, the future of baseball training. With the PX3, you can practice like you play. There is a better way to train your athletes. With an easy to use touchscreen controller, you can program any pitch, any speed, at any location. The ProBatter Simulator is designed to replicate real game, real world pitching. 
Better practice, better play. Hit any spot inside or outside the strike zone. The PX3 features reliable mechanics and an optional automatic ball feeder system. Get the most from practice. In addition to baseball, the PX3 is perfect for softball. With the PX3, no more relying on practice pitchers or basic pitching machines. Better practice, better play. Pro Batter. Train like it's game day. Step up to the plate with confidence. Hello, this is Wayne Mazzoni, host of And That's the Game podcast. I hope you're enjoying listening and watching the podcast as much as I am making it. It's really been enjoyable to connect with all these great people, great baseball people. Uh, the purpose of this message is to let you know about College Baseball Advisors, a company that I founded a couple years back after 30 years as a college baseball coach. I basically guide players and families through the recruiting process. If you're interested in learning more, please go to College Baseball Advisor. Dot com and learn more or book a call where we basically will meet and talk about your recruiting process. I'll lay out a three-step plan for you to move forward. If after that call you think I'm someone that could help you in this process, we can discuss that. If not, you just want to take that information and use it to go forward, that's great as well. So hope to see you down the road. Thank you. Okay, we're back on our podcast and that's the game podcast sponsored by Pro Batter Sports. Uh, presented by Pro Batter Sports, pardon me, not sponsored by. Um, and we're going to go back to this recruiting process. We had just left off with this list here about how to organize, you know, the tracking of the recruiting process. After you have a list of schools that you believe are right for you, your job as the athlete and the parent is to connect in some way with the college coach. Does Amherst know about you? Are they interested? Does... Um, University of Maryland, know about you, are they? So how do you go about getting the college coach to know about you? Because again, as I said a little earlier, it is overwhelming for them. The University of Maryland has four coaches that recruit. University of Maryland is recruiting, recruiting mostly East Coast, but still will look at kids all over the country, hundreds of thousands of kids on thousands of teams at different camps and tournaments and showcases. And it can really be overwhelming. So there's only a few things you can do to go from an unknown at one of these schools to a known to then get evaluated. Your goal is to get evaluated. So obviously the best scenario is to be seen playing live at your high school games or at your travel games, okay? Now this could be very difficult as for reasons I just said, high school is especially difficult because when you're in season, the college is in season, Typically, coaches try to go watch games on Monday and Thursday. Monday's an off day by for most coaches in the NCA since they played Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So most high school coaches will put their best pitcher on Monday where the college can come watch that pitcher throw on a Monday. And then Thursday's another day. Very few colleges play on Thursday because they've either played Tuesday or Wednesday and they play again Friday. So they might have a light practice and a coach can go out and recruit. If your high school team happens to be able to make the playoffs play late in the year, by that time, many colleges will be done with their season, except for those that make the postseason, and they will come out and watch high school games. So obviously, if you're on a quality team, as the year goes on, you're going to have coaches that will see your high school games. And then, of course, with your travel games, you're still always hoping to message a coach. Make it easy to find your schedule. Anytime you're communicating with a coach, here's where I'll be in June, July, and August. Communicate that because a coach doesn't go to Diamond Nation with 120 teams over a four-day tournament and walk in, get a packet, and go, oh, I like the name of that team. I'll walk over to that field. No. Ahead of time, they say, I want to see a pitcher at the 8 o'clock game. At the 10 o'clock game, I'm going to go look at a shortstop, and then I'm going to have lunch, and then I'm going to drive off-site to go watch this catcher I heard about at the 1 o'clock game. That's very structured. So you're tr always trying to let a coach know where you will be and what your schedule is. If you're gonna use camps as a piece, you really have two options. I get asked about this all the time. One camp option is more of a showcase. There's many colleges there. There's also many kids there. It's usually run by an independent business doing it for a profit, right? They are hiring college coaches, paying them so they're required to be there. And then of course that company, puts on their website, Yale will be there, Sacred Heart, Fairfield, Boston College, name, and that's the case. So if you're not sure on your list of schools, those camps make sense because you can go to one camp 
and be seen by a lot of schools. In this day and age, it's camps like Showball and Head First and Best in the U.S. and I-95 and Play to Win. Those types of places run bigger camps. Now, there is a couple of negatives to bigger camps. Number one is a coach might be assigned to watch a game on a certain field, but you're playing on a different field. Secondarily, you might have a coach at that school who was a new or younger coach, not the decision-making coach, who's at that camp because they're going to get the paycheck for working that camp because they need the money. So that is an option I prefer, as your list gets narrowed, to go directly to that school's prospect camp. You're interested in Lehigh? Go to the Lehigh prospect camp. They will work you out exactly the way they want. All their coaches will be there. You'll get to meet current kids on the team. You'll get to see the school and facilities. And very quickly, you'll get to find out whether Lehigh is a fit for you or not. It's difficult to do if you haven't done your legwork ahead of time. Be specific on the camps. But if you have, that's absolutely a key part of the recruiting process. Of course, in this day and age, having video is crucial. Sometimes a coach won't go watch a kid unless they see some video first. So getting video that has practice footage, what do I mean? BP, bullpen, taking ground balls, fly balls, showing some just skill type work, ideally with metrics, exit velocity, pitching velocity, throwing velocity, et cetera, is great. And if you have some game footage as well, you can then create a two minute video, which is a combination of skill work, and game footage, and that becomes your video, which is something you typically want to put on Twitter and pin it to your um, account so that it's at the top of the screen. And when a coach comes in for the first time, they can see your highlight video. And then the next huge piece is a reference. People recruit through people that they know, people that they trust. So your high school coach, your travel coach, if you have a scout or a lesson coach, or even someone like me, this is what I do for a career now. I advise kids and use my lifelong connections with college coaches to get a kid evaluated by a college coach. I never tell anyone that I work with, nor should you ever hear from anyone. Well, I guarantee I can get you recruited at such a place. That is false. Okay. What you're looking to do is get evaluated, get Lehigh to say, you're not good enough. We don't need catchers. Your grades aren't, you want feedback. So the goal is to get evaluated by a college coach. And however you do that, whether it's be seen live or at a camp through video, or getting a reference to open the door for you. That's how you bridge the gap from one of the many to sort, you know, to get a college coach to, to look for you. I always say this, um, if your plan to get recruited is simply to email the college coach or go online and fill out questionnaires, you better get your stuff ready for club baseball. You are very, very, very unlikely to get recruited for college. While colleges vary on how much they read the emails and the questionnaires, I don't think most college coaches think to themselves, well, boy, I need a shortstop. Let me go log on my computer and see who sent me an email and I'll pick a shortstop out of that bunch. Unfortunately, it's not the case. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you doing those things. But if that's your only plan is to reach out to coaches by email and questionnaires, it's going to be very, very difficult. Again, how do I know this? I spent you know, 20 years when they're coaching. I coach longer than that, but 20 years with the internet and phones and emails and know what that's, what that's like. Occasionally, I would look at an email from a player if I spoke to his coach first and they said, hey, this kid reached out to you. He's a really good fit, good kid check out his email. All right, I'll go in my system and search for that, but generally not looking at all the emails to find your recruiting class. All right. So after you get this contact and you get evaluated and some feedback from some college coaches on your list, there's really only a, a couple of things that you can do, right? If you get negative feedback of all the schools on your list are saying they're not interested, well, option one is to get better to get faster, to get stronger, to throw more strikes, to throw harder, to get a third pitch, to get a better backhand, to learn how to base hit bunt, to be a better hitter, to get better, right? If you got rejected, they didn't think you were good enough. So option one is to get better. And it could be in some of these things, whether it's you need to sleep better, eat better, strength work, skill work, mental work, um, velocity command, I kind of just touched on that. And the second option, right, you can either get better and keep your list as it is or change your list, right? So, for example, let's give a, a, a perfect example here. So you want to play at Georgetown 
a really solid Division I baseball program. And they think you're a talented player, just not good enough for them. Well, your option one is to get better, so they think you're good enough. Or option number two is pick a Division three school that's similar to a Georgetown. So like a Franklin or Marshall or a Johns Hopkins or a Swarthmore or a Gettysburg or a Dickinson. That's another option. You'd have a great life experience and play baseball and meet great friends and get a great education at those schools as well. So your other option is to adjust your list of schools. This here, the step eight, I'm going to make really speedy. Um, this has become much easier, and I'm actually going to put it up on the screen right now. In January of 2023, what's on the screen right now says you no longer need an SAT or an ACT to be able to play at the Division One or Two, which are the scholarship levels. Previously, you needed an SAT or an ACT score, which would coincide with what your core GPA was, which I'll cover in a minute. What does all this mean in the screen right now? It's this. You no longer need a board score for the NCA purposes. Yes, you still may need it if the college requires it or if you think it can help your case getting accepted or getting more financial aid at a, of a, at a school, but you no longer need it to be eligible to play college baseball. So what the rules are, are is fairly simple. To play at the Division I or II level as a freshman, when you graduate your high school, the NCA wants to know what your GPA was in your 16 core courses at your high school. They don't want your overall transcript. They want to know what the 16 core courses are, English, math, social studies, and science from ninth grade through senior year. In those 16 courses, your GPA can be no lower than a 2-3 for Division I. It could be no lower than a 2-2 in Division II. Division three does not have this system. And again, it used to be that depending on what your GPA was, you had to have a corresponding SAT or ACT school. So I'd really have to teach this intensively to make sure people understand it. And as of more than a year ago, they changed that and they made everybody's life a whole lot easier when it comes to being eligible academically as a college freshman. Why is this something that people have to be aware of? They do because you have to be a, a minimum of a 2-3 or 2-2 student in those core courses to be able to play as a freshman. You can't just blow off classwork because you're good at baseball and everything's going to work out fine. Okay, so to the two remaining pieces here. Admissions is obviously a big part of this process. The baseball is great, but you got to have to get admitted into the school before all of that can happen, right? So generally the way it works is that when a coach knows they like a player, they ask for a transcript. So you can send in an unofficial transcript and then the coach will do a pre-read on you. A pre-read is basically an intake of information. Your name, your address, your phone number, are you coming in as a freshman, a transfer, are you a scholarship candidate, a walk-on, preferred walk-on candidate, a tryout candidate, um, what is your social media accounts? What are your grades? Are you honors eligible? Have you done community service? Do you have any discipline issues? So it's a pretty thorough overview of you as a high school person and student. That pre-read sheet along with the transcript goes to admissions and admissions will give feedback on whether you are admissible or not at that time, not whether you're accepted or not because you have not applied to that school. It's just at this moment in time, it could be in your sophomore year, could be in your junior year, whether you are admissible at that point, right? And then depending on what institution we're talking about, a coach may have an ability for those that are in the ad inadmissible category to move them more towards admissible with their support. So that's something as you're being recruited by that coach, it's certainly worth talking about after the coach asks for a transcript and does a pre-read the coach is going to respond back with that information and where you will discuss your ability to get in and the coach's ability to help you. Two other things on admissions. If you're looking at the New England Small Collegiate Athletic Conference, the NESCAC, or the Ivy League, you want to do some research specifically into their recruiting process. So these are high academic schools that typically recruit similarly as conferences. What do I mean by that? So one year, all of a sudden, Columbia and the Ivy League can't say, you know what, this year, let's just let in any kind of students. 
we're going to really win athletically. We're going to take in great baseball players and we're just going to win the conference. They've agreed that they're not going to do that as a conference. So there are parameters for the NESCAC and the Ivy League, which basically says you have to have um, certain grades, board scores, and um, basically uh, your candidacy, if that's the, the right word, that has to be the same within that conference. So I would just simply do this, and I don't want to cover it on this short presentation, NESCAC athletic recruiting, Ivy League athletic recruiting, and get some more details because it's different than everyone else. Um, now, um, the, the final screen, which is going to come up in a second, we'll talk about baseball scholarships specifically. But soon enough, after the coach gets your transcript and submits it, they're going to tell you what you qualify for academically. At some point, if you're a baseball scholarship candidate, they're going to have to offer you and say, well, you've got $15,000 in academic money. We think you're worth $15,000 of a baseball scholarship. There's $30,000 which will never have to be paid back. That's yearly. That does not have to be paid back. You might qualify for other uh, federal money and loans. That's not what we're discussing here. That's separate. This is athletic, you know, specific things that we're talking about. And some of you, rare, some of you will actually get NIL offers, be able to play at power conferences with big programs that have NIL name, image, and likeness money, that could come to you on top of the grants that you're getting from that university. So it's lesser in baseball than it is in football and basketball, but it's become big in the power five schools uh, at various sports. So NIL is another piece. Um, I let this on the screen. I often take this out. This is the maximum scholarships allowed per sport. I first put it in there for the women. And again, I could have taken this out, but just in case a parent is watching, that also has a daughter that's an athlete. Much of the process is similar. And I thought I'd at least leave this on the screen for you to look at if your daughter plays one of these sports. For the men, the number hasn't changed in a long time. For Division I, you're allowed 11.7 scholarships. In Division II, you're allowed nine. I could do a half an hour of what this all means, but I'm going to try to make it relatively simple. If the university costs $10,000, which none do, but if it costs $10,000 for tuition, room and board, and books, 10,000 times 11.7 would be 117,000. I believe that's the correct math, yes. So what does that mean? That means that that university would have $117,000 worth of institutional money to give out to baseball players. Now, they could give kids a full cost at $10,000. They could give a kid a partial scholarship. They could divide them up however they want. There's one rule in baseball that does not take place in any other rule. And that only that rule is that if they give any money, baseball money, it must be a quarter of the cost of the school. So it must be a minimum of 25%. And that came about when many schools would recruit, over recruit, give six shortstops $2,000. So they would, you know, be scholarship level players. They'd bring them in. They'd find the one best shortstop after a year, give him all the money and then reduce the money on the other players. So they now changed it and made it that it has to be a minimum of 25%. Um, so on most college baseball teams with a roster of 35 people, it roughly falls into these three categories that kids are on the team. Roughly a third don't get any baseball money whatsoever. They might get academic money, but they're getting no baseball money. These are recruited walk-ons. These were heavily recruited players that either the coach did not think they were ready for a scholarship or did not have a scholarship left or at that position left. A third of the players are getting some money, maybe 25 to 50 percent. And that could be a combination of academic and baseball money. So if the school costs $65,000, maybe that player's getting $28,000, $30,000, which is still a huge help, but still leaves an outlay of money. And then there's roughly a third, maybe less, of kids getting 50 to 75%, maybe at certain schools, up to a full cost of, of the, the school. Typically, where does that go to? It goes to where you would think. Pitchers, catcher, shortstop, center field. Not always, but typically that's how it goes, even if that's a person that they recruited as a shortstop 
and then brought in and put the third base or second base or the outfield. Coaches typically are spending money on pitching and then elite defense. And of course, you know, someone that really runs well, but everyone, you know, in recruiting and why it's an interesting process is everyone does their business a little bit differently. Some like speed, some like big players, some like transfers, some like lefties, some like lefty bats. Everyone recruits a little bit differently. And there's no one way to sort of blanket say what every coach is particularly looking for. All right. So the last, oh, here's the final thing. And then I'm going to give some follow-up information. And I'm going to make this quick. You could just look at the screen for this. The bottom line is there are two very stressful times when you're going through the recruiting process. The first time is when people are, your friends are getting interest and in committing and et cetera, and you're not getting any attention. It's very stressful, you know, depressing, frustrating time. But another stressful time is you have two or three or four schools that you love that all seem great and that have given you a month deadline and you don't know what to do. You're afraid of making the wrong decision. So if you're looking at the screen, I would check out A, B, C, and D, but the reality is to investigate more, to kind of test drive the school. Go in, check out some classes, eat the food in the cafeteria, go check out the dorms, go watch a practice or a game, talk to kids in the team, um, go to see an event on campus, try to basically kick the tires of the school rather than just say, well, I talked to that coach a half an hour, they seem great, I'll commit there. And maybe they are great, or maybe you're frustrated within six months of being at that school because things are not the way they thought, you know, the way they are, the way they thought you were. So to try to make that visit and really get to know more about the school from all aspects is what usually will help you make a gut decision that'll prove to be the, the right one for the long term. Um, last thing for me is those of you again, and I can read this out for those listening, if you have any interest from this talk to ask me a question to follow up in any way, 203-260-4932 is the phone number you can reach me. My e email is goofy, but easy to remember, wayne at wayne mazzoni, that's M-A-Z-Z-O-N-I.com. Um, and then the website is College Baseball Advisor. What you can see on the website are players I've previously worked with players that I'm currently working with. But if you want to book a recruiting strategy call, my calendar's on there. It is a no cost session where basically I meet with you and your parent, uh, the whole family, and, and talk about what I see out of your recruiting process and give you some next steps. And if we see a fit that you like my style and I think it's a fit of you as a player in person, we could discuss how I work with people individually, but it could also be the only time we ever talk and I've just helped you get onto your goal of, of playing college baseball. Um, again, if this was a live presentation, I would take questions as there should be hundreds of questions and what I covered, but I certainly wanted to thank um, Pro Batter Sports. Uh, ProBatter.com is a tremendous, tremendous tool to help you as, develop as a baseball player. Um, and Pro Batter obviously sponsors this podcast, but I want to give you firsthand information of why I think Pro Batter is a, is a game changer for your baseball development and really thus your recruiting. Many those, those that are in the know with baseball know it's very difficult to practice the sport as you play it in a game, right? Because it's tough to get a really good pitcher to throw different pitches where can you find that? You can't rent a person to do that. A lesson instructor can't do that. The pitchers on your team can't do that because they have to stay fresh for games. So you wind up facing batting practice or underhand or doing T work or even going to a machine, but that throws all the same speed of pitches. Well, pro batter, they have a variety of machines for softball and even cricket, but their signature machine, machine for baseball throws not only behind the video screen, which shows the pitcher in motion, but it can throw any pitch. It can throw a fastball, a split, a knuckleball, a, a slider. It's an incredible machine to help you practice game-like because many people can hit a machine throwing 90, but actually can't hit in the game. But when you face a pro batter machine, you can get either a predictable pattern that you put in, or you can have live game-like at-bats in a really unbelievable way. So I highly encourage you to look at the Pro Batter machine for you personally, 
at one of your facilities um, to get the pro batter machine because it's really it's really that much of a breakthrough in technology worth looking at. So again, thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that it shed a little bit of light on this crazy recruiting process. Um, and we really didn't even cover things like the transfer portal, which has made the process even more confusing um, in this day and age. And that could be its its own episode. So thank you again from Pro Batter Sports. Again, this is your host, Wayne Mazzoni. And this is and that's the game podcast. Thank you very much. For more information about Pro Batter Sports, visit them on the web at probatter.com. I'm ready.